I can't believe it. No plant parasitic nematodes were recovered from the sample? Yeah! At the end of summer last year, I harvested my first ever round of sweet potatoes out of my raised bed in my Florida suburban backyard. The only thing is, when I harvested those sweet potatoes, I found root knot nematode damage all over them. This is absolutely a root knot nematode infestation. So at that point, I was determined to figure out how I could organically treat for root knot nematodes in my Florida backyard garden. And before the fall growing season, I did several soil amendments and then I selectively chose the crops I put in that raised bed. And today I received a soil test result back from the nematode assay lab at UF. And the test results said there are no plant parasitic nematodes in my soil. In this video, I'm going to share exactly how I did it. Let's get into it. If you've been following this story, you probably remember this video right here where I talked about my battle plan for the nematode management. In that video, I talked through the details of the five pillars of nematode management. In this video, I'll just briefly share what those five pillars are so that we're all on the same page. Pillar number one is crop rotation. Crop rotation is beneficial for managing root knot nematodes so that you can rotate host crops with non-host crops and decrease the population of your root knot nematodes. The second pillar is cultivar selection. And that means plant resistant varieties wherever possible. So if you've seen like a nematode resistant bell pepper like a Carolina wonder bell pepper or a nematode resistant tomato with the MI gene like a Sanibel tomato, that would be an example of cultivar selection to manage root knot nematodes. Pillar number three, soil management. This is where you can amend your soil in such a way that you increase the population of your beneficial nematodes, which will feed on your root knot nematodes. The fourth pillar is targeted control. This is where you can use something like a nematicide. How do you pronounce that? Is it nematicide? Nematicide? Nematicide. Nematicide. This is where you might use nematicides to manage the population of root knot nematodes. The fifth pillar is monitoring. This is where you choose a management plan and then during and at the end of the season, you monitor with soil tests and other means to adapt your plan as needed. Now these five pillars of nematode management are not an original thought from me. These pillars are something that I learned about from a UF IFAS video, which I'll drop a link to in the comments below. Now the reason I wanna bring this up is because it helps tell the story of what happened. Today is January 23rd and I'm in the process of amending my soil for my spring garden and so what I did was I took another soil sample test and sent it off to the UFIFS nematode assay lab so that I could see if my soil amendments and my crop rotation actually worked. As you already figured out from my intro, the lab results are great. It actually says there's no plant parasitic nematodes in my soil. So let's talk about the soil test itself. The first time I did the soil sample test was at the end of the summer, early fall last year. And I was expecting the results to say that there's a lot of root knot nematodes in the soil because of what I saw in the sweet potatoes, right? The results of that soil test showed that there was a population of root knot nematodes, but it actually said that it was not enough to cause damage on my sweet potatoes, which was obviously wrong because I had just harvested sweet potatoes with nematode damage, right? But there were some major flaws in the way that I did the soil sample the first time that I made sure to improve this time around. The first soil sample test I did, listen to this timeline. On August 29th, 2024, I harvested my sweet potatoes with root knot nematode damage. Then I figured out that there's a lab at UF where I can get my soil tested and figure out how bad the problem is. And so I collected my sample on September 5th. And then I sent it off the same day, but I sent it through USPS and I didn't overnight it. The lab received the soil five days later on September 10th. Then the results were provided to me another seven days later on September 17th. The results did not come out as I expected them to on that first test. And some of the reasons I figured was there was too much time in between harvesting the sweet potatoes and sending the soil sample. The soil was left fallow and some of the root knot nematode population probably died before they actually were put under a microscope. So this time what I did was I called the lab and I spoke to someone there who gave me some advice on taking better soil samples. One of the tips he said was, you definitely need to overnight your sample and you need to overnight it with UPS or FedEx instead of USPS. The reason for that is USPS mail goes to the university and then the lab has to go fetch that mail from the university. But if you send it UPS or FedEx, it goes directly to the lab. And the reason you need to overnight it is because you don't want so much downtime in your soil where the root knot nematodes might die. He also said to send it the same day that you collect the sample. 
So pretty much the goal is to minimize the time between collecting your sample and having it received by the lab. He also recommended that I send it on a Monday. And this makes sense because if you overnight it on Friday and it gets there on Saturday and no one's working in the lab and no one's going to be working in the lab until Monday, you kind of just wasted your efforts with overnighting the soil and minimizing that timeline, right? So. I sent it on Monday, January 13th, and it was received by the lab on Tuesday, January 14th. And I got a response from the lab really quickly on January 16th. So it was all within one work week, which was great. So I feel like I eliminated any of the wrongdoings with the soil sampling, and I still had much better results. I can't believe I got a result that said there's no plant parasitic nematodes in my soil, or at least not enough to detect under their microscopes. Now after I harvested those sweet potatoes that had the root knot nematode damage and then I amended the soil, in the fall I filled that raised bed with some short-term cool season crops. So we're talking radishes, arugula, and then I went for a little bit longer term, so kale, turnips, daikon radishes, and bok choy. In that first season after I discovered a root knot nematode problem, I made sure to avoid any of those large fruiting crops that are usually a host crop for root knot nematodes. So I avoided any peppers, eggplant, tomatoes in that raised bed, just until I kind of figured out where I stood with the root knot nematodes. But now, looking forward into my spring season, with a soil test that says there's not a root knot nematode population problem in my raised bed, I feel good about putting my large fruiting crops in that raised bed again. Now I did go ahead and buy seeds for some root knot nematode resistant crops. So for example, one, some of the peppers I'm gonna put in there are root knot nematode resistant varieties like Carolina Wonder Bell Pepper. I also bought Sanibel tomato seeds, which I'll also put in that raised bed. And I think I'm gonna try eggplant again. Now, something that I did in the fall that I want to carry forward into the spring is also interplanting with marigold. I think I should have marigolds going in my raised beds pretty much at all times. Now, one of the techniques you can do for soil management is cover cropping. Cover cropping is commonly done for root knot nematodes using mustards and also sun hemp or sorghum sudan grass. But I chose not to do a cover crop because it didn't say that my problem was so bad I needed to delay my fall plantings for that. However, what I did do is plant some mustard greens and marigolds in the garden so that those would naturally repel the root knot nematodes. My plan was at the end of the fall growing season to chop and drop that mustard green into the garden. And the other day I amended the soil with about two inches of organic compost, the exact same compost I used the first season, and I chopped and dropped those mustard greens. The next soil amendment I want to talk through is crab meal. The primary reason you should consider using crab meal is because of how the chitin in the crab meal helps increase the populations of the beneficial microorganisms that fight against your root knot nematodes. The next thing I'm adding is earthworm castings. Now I have vermicompost bins in each one of the raised beds and so theoretically I am getting earthworm castings throughout the growing season with the worms when they move around in the garden in and out of those buckets. Earthworm castings are a very mild fertilizer so you don't have to worry about adding too much. I'll put a link in the description box below to all of these amendments if you're interested in picking any of them up. So now we know what soil amendments to use in our gardens that actually work to fight against root knot nematodes. In the fall, I chose not to do any targeted control like nematicides, and I agree, I'm still not going to do anything like that. I'm not going to buy beneficial nematodes. I'm not going to buy a nematicide to apply to the soil because there's just no reason for it right now. What I am going to do is continue to monitor this. I think this spring season will be pretty interesting because I'm going to plant host crops and see how they do. If you're interested in seeing if I can keep the root knot nematode population under control while planting host crops, hit that subscribe button and follow along. See you next time, guys.